Oi! Welcome to The Exchange. I'm Dee Smith, and today I'm going to be speaking with Elizabeth Economy of the Council on Foreign Relations here in New York and Christopher Sabatini of Columbia University and the think tank Global Americans. And we're going to be discussing some of the very interesting and somewhat disturbing aspects of Chinese activity in Latin America. This ranges across a whole range of activities from huge hydroelectric projects in places like Brazil to a surveillance system, Chinese engineered surveillance system in Ecuador, funded by the Chinese, by the way, to an increased Chinese media presence across the entire region. Chinese efforts, in other words, are increasingly intense and seem increasingly ubiquitous. This includes Chinese military and diplomatic engagement, as well as investment. China now surpasses both the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank as the region's top lender, with over $140 billion in financing just since 2005. And added to that, China has also created three cooperation funds with another $40 billion in financing for the region. In January of this year, China even invited Latin American countries to join its One Belt, One Road initiative. So, Liz, Chris, welcome to the exchange. And Chris, what's going on with China in Latin America? Well, it's definitely showing more of an interest. Uh, at first, most of that interest came in the form of opening up its markets for its own need for primary products, whether it's iron or oil or copper, gold, um, even soybeans and chicken. But increasingly, that became more of, uh, because of that need, became more in terms of investment and in terms of diplomatic engagement. We've seen already just recently uh, Panama, the Dominican Republic, and El Salvador um, flip and recognize the People's Republic of China over Taiwan. Uh, we've seen them engage now in Latin America in the One Belt, One Road project, particularly in Panama recently. There's been a series of, of very interesting investments in Panama. Uh, in addition, um, there's been a series of investments, direct investments, uh, primarily concentrated, well, all, all concentrated in natural resource extraction um, or some form of natural resource, whether it's hydroelectric dams or oil or uh, other forms of mining. But primarily, if you look at the breakdown of what countries, it's mostly ones that China would find a better ally in terms of whether it's Nicaragua even, uh, Ecuador, or Venezuela, and even at times Bolivia. So it spans the gamut right now. I think diplomatically, the question is, what is their long game? Economically, there's clear interest there in terms of specifically receiving resources, but what is their diplomatic long game? And I don't, there, I don't think what we really know yet. So Liz, that's a perfect question for you. What, what is the diplomatic long game? What's, what's the purpose of China? doing these things in Latin America. Right. Well, I, I think as Chris suggested, you know, initially, if you look back to about 1999, when then President Jiang Zemin and Premier Zhu Rongji announced the going out strategy, uh, that was all about mostly China's state-owned enterprises going out to Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, in search of natural resources to be able to fuel their economic growth, which was, you know, they're, you know, averaging 10 to 12 percent per year uh, at that point in time. Um, but the advent of Xi Jinping has brought something a little bit different to the table. Uh, you know, he has called for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, uh, which is really about reclaiming a degree of centrality for China on the global stage. Uh, and it's not just, you know, Latin America, but again, it's the entire world at this point, which Xi Jinping looks at to, to be in service uh, of that objective. And the Belt and Road Initiative is one aspect of that. Uh, you know, initially, Belt and Road was mostly about uh, exporting Chinese overcapacity, uh, still looking for commodities uh, that China needs, you know, oil in Venezuela or, or soybeans in Brazil. Um, but it's also about, uh, you know, amping up China's political and security presence. Uh, you know, you mentioned the surveillance system uh, that they, they're putting in place in Ecuador. Peru and Bolivia are also interested in that same thing. Uh, the media uh, option, China wants to change the narrative globally uh, about China. Right? It says that the West has for too long dominated the story about China. It wants to have its own newspapers, its own media people there. You know, they did a training session, a five to six month training session with Latin American journalists in China, right, to try to get them on board with, you know, looking at China the way that China wants them uh, to look at China. So um, there are many, it's, it, there are many different elements uh, to sort of China's engagement at this point, um, but, but they really want to have, you know, a group of allies if not formally allied, the way that we have formal, in the United States have formal allies, a group of allies that when they're in the United Nations talking about internet governance or human rights, uh, these countries will support them. 
So, you know, this has uh, long been considered, Latin America has long been considered the United States geopolitical backyard. And so the, what China's doing there in this intensive effort across all these elements is, is perhaps a very provocative thing for them to do. What do you think, do, does that enter into, is it an intentional provocation? And is it some kind of intentional quid pro quo for the U.S. presence in, in the Pacific, longstanding presence in the Pacific? Or is this just part of the Chinese global strategy? So I, I think um, it's not an intentional quid pro quo, I don't believe. I think it is part of the broader strategy. You know, what they're doing in Latin America is exactly what they're doing in Africa and in Southeast Asia. It has the same mix of, you know, uh, infrastructure development, ports, hard infrastructure ports, railroads, highways, uh, you know, power plants, uh, the digital belt and road, which is fiber optic cables, e-commerce and satellite systems. You know, everywhere you see the Chinese uh, doing these same things. Uh, the military element, right? China is, you know, invited uh, military officials from 11 Latin American countries to, to come to China for military training. They do the exact same thing in these other places. I think we're more sensitive to it here in the United States because, because, of course, it is our backyard. And I think up until Xi Jinping, or maybe a little bit before, the Chinese were also sensitive to it. Uh, but you know, China can't reclaim its centrality on the global stage unless it's on the global stage, and that includes Latin America. So I think there's, um, they certainly understand that we're sensitive, but at this point, they don't really care. Right. Yeah, I don't think there'll be a direct challenge in that sense. I agree with you. They're sensitive to U.S. interests. They don't want to directly confront the United States. And in fact, a lot of what they're doing is very subtle. It's difficult. You know, if you, <laughs> if you add it all up, it looks a little worrying. But you know, whether it's expansion of Confucian Institutes, the training of military officials, they plan on having over half a million uh, uh, students tr uh, studying in Chinese universities by 2020, not all Latin American. Um, they've, they've also, as you mentioned, the media presence. Um, it, it is, you know, it's multifaceted, much the way the United States, although that was more to build specific allies, but was is trying to change the perceptions of Latin America, and the, of China in Latin America and other countries uh, as a way of just simply building influence. So One Belt, One Road was initially conceived as, as a sort of uh, pan-Asian European project that connected China to Europe. But now it, it really is it's the whole globe. And then, when did that change occur? When did, when did the, the, the One Belt, One Road, I know it was this year, just earlier this year, that, that the Chinese invited Latin American countries to join it. But when did that thinking change in China? So the Belt and Road was um, announced first in 2013 uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, and that was really the belt part of it, which is the overland route. There are six different corridors that were included in the initial conception. And then in 2014 in Indonesia, Xi Jinping outlined the maritime part, which actually does go all the way to Africa. So it's really China includes the Middle East and the rest of Asia and or really Southeast and Central Asia, and Europe, as you mentioned, out to, to Africa. So it's the um, old world. So basically. right, it's a recreation. Of, there's nothing better for China's you know, great rejuvenation than basically recreating the idea of the Silk Road and the maritime spice routes, right? So that's what the original conception was. But it's very opportunistic, right? There was, it's, so as I mentioned, you know, that then there became a digital Belt and Road. Then there was a polar you know, Belt and Road to connect China to Europe through the Arctic more quickly. And Latin America is really just the next stop um, you know, on this expansion. And a number of Latin American countries have indicated interest. So it's not simply China declaring, we are now including Latin America in the Belt and Road. They are. But it's also true that Bolivia and others have stepped up and said, we would like to be part of the Belt and Road. And I think one, one last point I'll make is that in really much of what China is doing is, again, not that different from what it started doing in the late 1990s. The difference is that there's a degree of interconnectivity, transnational element to it that didn't exist in China's first resource quest push. So this is about you know, connecting countries uh, through railroads and highways, not simply providing assistance to one discrete country. And if I can say, too, what's interesting, as much as this whole initiative sort of taps into a deep felt uh, need and desire on the part of China, what they're doing in Latin America also taps into what Latin America wants and needs. It really is looking for a global rebalancing in its own. Even among pro-American leaders, you'll hear them say, like the former Ch Chilean ambassador to China, that this is this is their option. This is this is a moment if we can control this. Um, they're providing infrastructure which the United States and most development banks no longer provide. Um, they're providing very important markets 
Um, and they're also providing some form of, of diplomatic recognition uh, that, and, and an alliance in loosest form that many countries uh, crave. So the, the debt that China is offering Latin America now is, is perhaps less far along as the debt that it has been offering Africa. And Africa is a kind of exemplar of things that are going wrong with that right now. Can you talk just a bit about that and whether you think that will happen? What's, I mean, Africa is turning back to the International Monetary Fund. There are things that are, that are um, you know, not going as well as they, and they're, 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 they're not happy under the yoke of Chinese debt, let's say. If you can talk a little bit about that and whether you think that can develop in possibly in other countries, including Latin America. So I think certainly it's happening not only in, in Latin America, but um, in uh, Southeast Asia and in, in Laos and also in, you know, Maldives and Sri Lanka. And I mean, all throughout the Belt and Road at this point, you have, uh, I think the IMF itself identified eight countries uh, that have assumed so much debt as a result of the Belt and Road projects that they say they will never be able to repay this debt, right? And so that's when you see China do things like take control of a port, uh, in exchange. Um, you know, I would I, I would imagine that there will be a similar mix of countries in Latin America. There are those that are more robust and are in sort of better control of, of their, you know, situation uh, economically than others, right, and better educated at some level. I mean, it's one of the things I think is interesting about the U.S. approach to competing with the Belt and Road is that a big initiative out of USAID uh, is to talk about we just want to educate you know, people in different countries about their choices and about what it means when you take on this kind of debt. Because not all new leaders know uh, about this information. So I, I think already we've seen, if you look back to 2010, 2011, you know, pre-Belt and Road, just when China was engaging in the resource elements, countries like Brazil and Argentina started to fool around with their land laws in order to prevent the Chinese from acquiring too much land, right, their land ownership laws. So I think there's an awareness now out there, certainly among the larger uh, Latin American countries, about the potential pitfalls. You know, as they mm -hmm. see more and more countries along the Belt and Road reject projects, right, even projects that they'd already agreed to, I think it's, it's very instructive for a lot of Latin American countries. But I think Chris is probably more attuned to the relative, you know, strengths and weaknesses of, of the region. But it's, it's true. Countries began to become aware of this, not only in terms of foreign direct investment, but also in terms of investment in sort of mining. And a number of countries imposed stricter um, conditions on environmental regulations and labor regulations in places like Peru that China actually responded to. So it's, it hasn't been a one-size-fits-all model. But there there are countries that are deeply, deeply in hawk right now to, to, to China, in particular Venezuela, yeah, which right. has basically mortgaged its yes. entire energy future to China for loans that it's going to pay back and cut rate oil that whenever political change occurs and however it occurs, hopefully peacefully, um, any future government is going to find itself still tied to China and paying that back at a time when its oil production has slipped from 3 million barrels per day at the time of uh, Hugo Chavez's election in 1998 to 1.2 million barrels today. So you know, they've, they've basically sold off their own land wealth to China, Ecuador the same. So it really varies. And China too has also, um, China, I mean, rather Cuba, um, has also sort of become, become indebted more and more to China. And this will be difficult to turn the corner, you know, once there are regime changes in these countries. So it's, it's a bit of what, you know, they've, they've sought out allies. And another one in particular it's, that now we're looking at that's very dangerous is, is Panama. Uh, the Chinese have come in, very effectively played off political divisions among the Chinese, gov uh, the Panamanian government and political class, invest in a whole series of highways, railways, and port facilities um, that, you know, is, is a strategic uh, point, choke point for U.S. interests uh, in the hemisphere. So th there, there is the idea, and it's discussed particularly in Africa uh, with the situation there with Chinese, that, that, the, that the strategy of the, of the Chinese is to trap countries in, into essentially unpayable debt and then force them to give up strategic resources like ports yeah. in exchange for that. And, and, you know, I'd love to have your thoughts on that, but also at what point may some of these countries start to assert their sovereignty and nationalize these things? And what will China do in response right. to so that? I don't, I don't think that there's actually a deliberate effort um, on the part of the Chinese to trap the countries in, into then sort of giving up uh, strategic uh, assets. Uh, you know, I think the case in Sri Lanka, for example, was not about, you know, okay, we're going to get them so deeply in debt that we're going to get their port. I mean, we've also seen, you know, China now has majority stakes or outright control of ports in something like 76 uh, 
countries, right? And so, or 76 ports in 36 uh, countries. And so uh, they're finding ways to do it, you know, just by buying, buying stakes and, and doing it legitimately. So I don't, think, I don't think they want to trap these countries. I think it's a function of a, a lack of um, foresight on their part and clearly on the part of the countries themselves. And the Chinese themselves right now are going, undergoing a major interagency review of their lending practices. So they themselves are not interested in you know, going down this deep hole. Uh, and, and they're feeling a lot of pressure from the international community, you know, not just you know, the United States you know, talking about the evils of Chinese lending, uh, but the countries themselves. Again, you know, Mahathir out there saying you know, that re-elected uh, president of um, Prime Minister of Malaysia saying, you know, we're giving back these projects. They are no good for us. So a lot of leaders now are standing up and pushing back. That's not good for China's reputation. Uh, so I, I don't see it as trying to trap them. You know, in terms of when will they stand up and, and you know, assert their sovereignty, I think we've already seen when there are elections in some of these uh, countries and new leaders come in, they're perfectly happy to talk about renegotiating the terms of bad deals that were made by the previous bad presidents or prime right. ministers. So, so I can see that type of thing happening. Outright nationalization, maybe, maybe not, but definitely renegotiating terms. Certainly their mantra in all this has been win-win, and perhaps I'm naive, <laughs> but, but that's, I think there's an element of truth in that in the sense that they don't want to completely confront. They're trying to do this in the, the most harmonious way possible so that they don't want, you know, it's obviously to their benefit. They want to gain leverage in these cases, but to have to confront a situation where there are clear winners and losers, I think, goes against their very grain. I will just say that in the China field, we have a saying that win-win for the Chinese means China wins twice. Yeah. So, you know, I know. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, this um, issue with Ecuador and the installation of a, a surveillance system and, and similar systems being of interest to other Latin American countries is, is somewhat concerning because not only will Ecuador, you know, not only does Ecuador have a, a, a very state-of-the-art system, but the Chinese may have back doors into it and may, you know, th extend their reach deeply into a Latin American country. Um, what's going on with that? Well, the Chinese you know, very much like the idea of having uh, some form of intelligence gathering in the Western Hemisphere. They also have a, a, um, a listening post in Cuba, for example, um, you know, just 90 miles off the coast of the United States that I think is, is useful for them. Um, and in the case of Ecuador, Yes, it gives them. I mean, we, we have a number of anti-narcotics, we being the United States, anti-narcotics operations um, that are being renegotiated in Ecuador, so they will be able to be able to monitor those as well. Um, and these state-of-the-art systems, in Mexico, for example, we saw that the Israelis sold to the Mexican government a system that was not supposed to be used for internal surveillance, but was. So um, you know, the Chinese are leveraging their technical capacity and offering this up. Uh, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we find out later that Venezuela was doing the same for them. Um, and so it's, it's, it, it is a troubling aspect to a whole new shift in spyware and spying, um, both domestically and internationally. And it's not the only example of, of a kind of egregious Chinese presence. I mean, what's going on with this uh, medical ship in, in, uh, in Venezuela? That's a, a strange so, episode. So what happened was, first of all, the Venezuelan government has denied that there's a humanitarian crisis in the island, despite the fact <laughs> that two, on the island, the country, despite the fact that 2.3 million people have been forced to flee uh, to neighboring countries. Um, but the Chinese sent the U.S. the the Harmony ship, which is a medical ship, to uh, Venezuela, and ironically, it was greeted by the defense minister Padrino. Um, and on display at the port when he arrived and welcomed them were more weapons and medical supplies. And they said this was a great example of China's sort of brotherhood and solidarity with the Venezuelan people. So they're clearly trying, and this happened just on the heels of the U.S. sending its USS Comfort ship, which is also a medical ship to Colombia to treat and help the Venezuelan refugees. That was denounced as a precursor to a U.S. intervention in Venezuela. The Chinese ship uh, to Venezuela was treated as a great sign of solidarity with uh, Venezuela's yeah. cause. Yeah. Has Chinese activity affecting the internal politics in Latin American countries? And you know, we're, in a, we're in a position in which a lot of countries are having elections right now. We're in a, uh, uh, a situation where you know, inter inter hemispheric trade needs to grow. Um, how is this affecting the internal 
systems within these countries? Well, there are a number of ways. First of all, you know, at a very symbolic level, when China first became uh, sort of a, a rising world power, it became an ideological justification for countries, for leaders like Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, for leaders like uh, um, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, sort of an offered an alternative to the neoliberal economic prescriptions that had been sort of current, and now suddenly another country comes along that's followed none of those and is becoming a world power. So at a symbolic level, it was very important and boosted, if you will, a lot of these leaders. Now what we're seeing, too, is that um, their investment, uh, in, in, the, in particularly their market in the, in the early aughts until the, the mid, the late uh, 2009, late aughts, um, it also boosted what were then leftist governments in power because the economies were growing so fast. The PT in Brazil, the Workers' Party in Brazil, the Peronist Party in Argentina um, became real beneficiaries of this windfall of Chinese demand for their products. But in addition, uh, as we see in Venezuela, as China has now extended all these lines of credit, very favorable to, to the Chinese or short-term favorable to the Venezuela, Venezuelans, it's also sort of vested them in the success of this current government in Venezuela, the Maduro government, which is flailing, which is contracted by almost a half now, um, which is going to face in 2018, one million percent inflation. Uh, it's tied them very closely to this government. So it's definitely changed the dynamics as much as they claim that they're not interested in interference, that they're, they want to maintain solid uh, uh, sovereignty. They're definitely changing it. But in addition to that, what they're also changing are these countries' foreign policies. We see again and again in a report we just published called Liberals, Rogues, and Enablers that more and more countries are voting with China uh, in the UN, in the UN Human Rights Council um, on issues of human rights, it, basically following that line of non-interventionism, not raising issues of human rights uh, in a way that really weakens, if you will, sort of the liberal infrastructure of the, 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 to support human rights and democracy that's emerged over the last several decades. Do you think that that's a uh, intentional? strategy on the part of China to, to undermine that, that part of the liberal international order? Precisely, yes, I do think. There, there's a number of organizations, parallel organizations that they've tapped into and created. Um, there's the Shanghai Regional Organization, uh, which has sort of created this fake, mostly active in Central Asia, that has uh, created these fake election monitors that go to, and they emulate what the UN would do or the Carter Center would do in terms of observing elections, but with none of the technical credibility or independence. Um, they've also reached out to a new Latin American regional organization called CELAC, the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States that not coincidentally excludes United States and uh, uh, Canada. They've tried to become a partner with them. They've even hosted them. And they've extended a whole series of scholarships for public officials to go to China. What they're trying to do in these cases is, is really erode international standards. In the case of CELAC, CELAC has said very clearly and very upfront from the beginning, it believes that it is the sovereign right of any country to determine its own form of government, something that flies in the face, basically, of decades of human rights concerning popular sovereignty and, and the rights to, to uh, um, human, uh, human rights and independence. Yeah. So another question that, that I think comes up and, and, and is important is, how is Chinese economic activity in the private sector affecting the opportunities for other countries that are not China um, in terms of investment in Latin America. And I'm not talking about the huge government projects. Is there, is there stuff going on in the, in the private sector as well? There is. Um, it's funny, the, uh, there's a study done by a professor at Notre Dame that discovered that in countries like, that would be more logical, uh, ideological allies of China, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, most of the investment was led by state-owned companies. It was in other countries, Chile, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, that investment was led largely by the private sector. So there is sort of a double game here being played. You mean the Chinese investment Chinese was led, investment led in, more in by the, countries like Brazil and Argentina? Yes, less state-controlled. So right. you know, they're, they're leading in these sort of ideological allies with more state-owned companies, um, places where it makes a little bit more, let's say, economic sense to invest, Brazil, right. um, Peru, which are mostly in natural resources, that's coming from more state-led, uh, state-oriented uh, enterprises. Right, right. So um, in, in the hemispheric aspect of this, what do you think the 
the approach or the response of the U.S. should be? This is it's difficult. It's very much the, the, the question that's current. Um, you know, we saw Rex Tillerson, former Secretary of State, when he was in Texas, talk about the, uh, the need for to renew the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, Donald Trump, the UNGA, made the same comment. Um, this really uh, irritates Latin American leaders, even pro-Latin American leaders, uh, who say we're, we're mature enough to maintain our own relationship. We don't need the Monroe Doctrine and U.S. paternalism uh, and all the baggage of the Monroe Doctrine, which has been used to justify interventions in the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Grenada, what have you, um, they think they have the capacity to do that. Um, I, I think there's a much more subtle response that's necessary. I think, first of all, the U.S. needs to res understand <clears throat> that there are very legitimate um, needs that China is responding to, the need for infrastructure. For example, uh, in, in the case of, of Brazil, the railways that take uh, goods from much of the interior to the ports uh, were built, most of them were built in 1945. They need to be upgraded. Um, this is a real, and, 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 you know, in places like Peru, only 30% of the roads are paved. Infrastructure is key to integrating these economies, not just across borders and with a global economy, but even internally. And China's offering to do that. The second thing is I think U.S. can begin to help, and there have been plenty of cases of Chinese investment where the deals have been cut behind closed doors. They've also included efforts um, that ignore um, environmental regulations so, such as the Belo Monte Dam in, in Brazil. The U.S. can help provide some sort of oversight and environmental guidance on these things. One person referred to it as a sort of the soft infrastructure needs uh, that can sort of help balance Chinese uh, tendency to overlook these regulations. And I think the last thing is the United States, uh, actually the next to last thing, the United States needs to bolster its soft diplomacy. That's become sort of very passe. Uh, we've seen now the Trump administration try to cut our educational exchange service, uh, programs in the State Department by over 75%. Soft diplomacy is one of the best tools we have for building long-term allies and relationships. Um, it's probably the best bang for the buck you can get in terms of diplomacy and at the, precisely the time the Chinese are ramping it up. And the last thing is I think, and it's a shame that the, this administration walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership because that was intended to create a, an alliance of, of uh, Asian Pacific countries and Latin American countries and the US and Canada to set a set of uh, an outline, a framework of trade rules that would sort of set the terms for the new global trade environment. Um, is a counterbalance to China's both economic weight and its questionable commitment at times to, to uh, international uh, rules of trade. And in this case, the Trump administration is right. The, the, the Chinese do engage in unfair labor and trade practices. But the answer isn't in unilateral tariffs. The answer is creating a block that ri forces them to rise to that standard. I think it's a shame we walked out. So that, you know, um, one of the distinctions that one hears about now, uh, uh, a term that's, that's come to rise in the foreign policy world, is sharp power as opposed to soft power. And so uh, how do you see that playing out in, in Latin America? There are a lot of examples of sharp power um, that we're seeing now. First of all, I mentioned the, the ramped up exchange programs that China's been promising, both sort of apprenticeships and scholarships for, for policymakers and for students the expansion of all these Confucius centers uh, that are all throughout Latin America now that are intended to you know, engage in better understanding, but also try to prevent recognition of, of Taiwan. Um, you know, we also see the, the efforts of, of you know, extending humanitarian assistance we see with China. Those are efforts at sharp power because they are intended with a very specific effort to uh, build China's alliances or leverage points in a way that it can be used in the, in the long term. And China, uh, rather, Ch Russia is engaging in the same thing. There's a Russia Today, the now infamous Russia Today uh, news service that's run by the Russian government, has a Spanish language service called uh, RT in Espanol. It is now available on all major uh, uh, cable packages in Latin America. And we've been tracking that for a while. And some of the stories they've been publishing have been outrageous. Claims that the US had sent the drones that recently tried to assassinate Maduro. Um, claims that um, Nicaragua was under an, a blockade, an, a, a military blockade by the United States. So these efforts at utilizing the media educational to further a specific slanted view is I think what we're referring to when we talk about sharp power. It's a whole different game and they're playing it very well. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what do you see as the next step in, in the evolution of Chinese involvement in Latin America? Where are we going? I think it's, 
I think it's a good question in the sense that, it, it, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all model. Uh, Venezuela is going to be one point. We'll see how far China is willing to go to prop up and support a regime that has clearly failed, um, is clearly bringing misery to its own people. And, and is not popular in the rest of Latin America. It's not popular in the rest of Latin America. So is it going to throw them, uh, through them recently extended a $5 billion uh, uh, loan to, China, to Venezuela, but you know, how long is it willing to go down this road, especially when, as you say, it risks incurring the wrath of Venezuelan people as well as uh, its neighbors, uh, Venezuela's neighbors. Um, but as I say, other countries are really very much exploring a way to deepen these relations. Um, I think you'll see more and more countries in the region begin to recognize China. They bring a, a lot of cash, a big checkbook. As I mentioned, Panama recently recognized China over Taiwan, and now China investment has flooded into uh, uh, Panama. Uh, to the Dominican Republic, which oddly enough is part of the uh, free trade agreement with the United States, uh, as is Panama, has recognized uh, China. El Salvador has recognized China. I think what you're going to see is more of an effort to bring them within their uh, uh, diplomatic circles, and with that comes a checkbook that the U.S. is going to struggle to match. Um, in that case, I think the play will be much more uh, subtle. Um, and then in other cases, I think you'll see, as we saw in Ecuador and other places, ways in which you're going to try to insinuate their surveillance capacities and other semi-military capacities in places like Cuba as a way of counterbalancing. Uh, again, not in terms of a confrontational way. They're, they really are very sensitive to this confrontation. But you know, they're looking for ways to build friendships that will blunt, if you will, U.S. authority, not power so much, as authority in multilateral organizations when the time comes, especially should there be some conflict, say, over the South China Sea. So thank you, Liz. Thank you, Chris, for being part of this conversation. It was a very fascinating examination of some really interesting issues, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you.